Good evening, I'm Judy Woodruff on the NewsHour tonight. After tragedy, what comes next? As America mourns the weekend's killings, a look at what can be done to keep firearms out of the hands of those who intend to do harm. And the facts behind the talking points linking mental illness to gun violence. Then a looming threat from Beijing. As the pro-democracy protesters in Hong Kong rage on, Chinese officials signal the potential for a military crackdown. Plus, remembering Toni Morrison, reflections on the life, literature, and legacy of the Nobel Prize winning author. The future was, you know, right there, right at your fingertips. And I was so happy to be among what I hadn't had when I was in Ohio, uh, African-American intellectuals. And that was the company I wanted to keep. All that and more on tonight's PBS NewsHour. The debate over guns in America is intensifying tonight after mass shootings that killed 22 people in El Paso, Texas, and nine in Dayton, Ohio. So are the investigations. The FBI today joined the investigation of the Dayton gunman, Connor Betts, who was killed by police. Agents said that he had shown interest in committing a mass shooting. We have uncovered evidence throughout the course of our investigation that the shooter was exploring violent ideologies. We have not seen any evidence that uh, the events in El Paso influenced him at this point. Again, we have lots of evidence to go through. President Trump plans to visit Dayton and El Paso tomorrow. His opponents, in turn, plan to protest his rhetoric on race and immigration and to demand action on gun violence. Dayton's Democratic mayor, Nan Whaley, said today she backs both sentiments. His rhetoric has been painful for many in our community, uh, and I think that people should stand up and say they're not happy if they're not happy that he's coming. I'm disappointed with his remarks. I mean, I think they fall fell really short. He mentioned, like, gun issues one time. Um, I think, you know, watching the president over the past few years on the issues of guns, he's been, um, I don't know if he knows what he believes. Ohio's Republican governor, Mike DeWine, urged mandatory background checks for virtually all gun sales. Today, that was today, he also called for court action to prevent potentially dangerous people from getting guns. We'll hear about federal gun control legislation after the news summary. The FBI also says that it is investigating whether last month's mass shooting in Gilroy, California, was domestic terror. It turns out the gunman had a target list of religious institutions, federal buildings, courthouses, and the two major political parties. He killed three people and wounded 13 at a popular food festival before killing himself. The Chinese currency stabilized today after sliding on Monday to an 11-year low. That calmed Wall Street, and stocks made up almost half of Monday's losses. The Dow Jones Industrial Average gained 311 points to close at 26,029. The Nasdaq rose 107 points, and the S&P 500 added 37. Meanwhile, China's central bank denied manipulating its currency to gain advantage in a trade fight with the U.S. Instead, it warned Washington to pull back from the brink of greater economic damage. But White House economic adviser Larry Kudlow argued the Chinese are bearing the real burden. China's slashing its prices. That's killing their profits in their companies. Production and supply chains are moving out of China. Uh, we have elastic, elasticity of demand. We, our importers can shop elsewhere outside of China. That's hurting China. President Trump also played down fears of a prolonged trade fight, and he vowed again to protect American farmers after Beijing said that it will stop buying U.S. agriculture products. Separately, President Trump has frozen all of the Venezuelan government's assets in the U.S. in a new blow at President Nicolas Maduro. The sanctions also mean that U.S. companies and individuals could face penalties for doing business with Maduro's government and his top supporters. This is the latest U.S. move to aid opposition leader Juan Guaido in his bid to oust Maduro. 
The United States fired off a new warning to Turkey today not to attack Kurdish forces in northeastern Syria. The mainly Kurdish Syrian Democratic Forces have fought against the Islamic State, or ISIS. But Turkey regards the Kurds as terrorists. U.S. Defense Secretary Mark Esper said today that a Turkish invasion would be unacceptable. He spoke en route to Japan. We, we want to sustain the continued defeat, at least of the physical caliphate of ISIS, right? That, that, that becomes a question if, if they move in and the SDF is impacted. Uh, we're obviously holding thousands of, uh, of fighters, ISIS fighters. And so um, those are some of, the, some of the things we risk if there's a unilateral uh, incursion into, into uh, northern Syria by the Turks. In Ankara, Turkey's president, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, again talked of military action, insisting that control of the Syrian border region is critical to Turkey's safety. It's our country's top priority to drain the terror swamp in Syria's north. Turkey cannot feel safe as long as the forces in our south which are growing like a cancer cell and being grown with the heavy weapons of our allies is not eliminated. Military delegations from the U.S. and Turkey have been meeting in Ankara this week trying to negotiate a settlement. North Korea says that it keeps testing missiles because the United States is inciting military tensions. The North fired two more short-range missiles into the sea early today, the fourth such test in two weeks. In a statement, Pyongyang defended the tests and cited U.S. weapons sales to South Korea and a joint U.S.-South Korean military exercise. Back in this country, former Alaska Senator Mike Gravel has officially dropped out of the 2020 Democratic presidential race. He said in a video today that he will back Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders for the nomination. Gravel is 89. He did not actively campaign or appear in any of the Democratic debates. And Nobel Prize winning novelist Toni Morrison has died in New York after a brief illness. She pioneered American multiculturalism in her novels and was the first African American woman to win the Nobel Prize for Literature. Toni Morrison was 88 years old. We'll explore her life and legacy at the end of the program. Still to come on the News Hour, grappling with a scourge of mass shootings, what can be done to stop them? The facts behind the political talking points linking mental illness to gun violence. A turn to Hong Kong and the risks faced by the pro-democracy protesters there, plus much more. We return now to El Paso and how that community continues to grapple with the weekend's deadly attack. Our Dan Bush is there. He's been reporting from both sides of the border today. Hi, Dan. So first, we know you've been talking to people in El Paso. Tell us a little of what they're saying. So I'm here right next to the Walmart, Judy, where the shooting took place. You can see maybe behind me, people from the community have been trickling now day after day to pay their respects, to drop off flowers. It's a community that's trying to cope with this tragedy. I spoke to one woman who was working inside the Walmart at the time who said she felt so defenseless, crouched in a electronics aisle, that she decided to take up shooting classes and potentially get a concealed carry permit. Another mother who was not uh, at the scene of the shooting who said that her and her husband bought their eight-year-old son a bulletproof backpack to take to school. El Paso School District begins just a little later this month. So people are really trying to figure out how to move forward. And at the same time, the Latino community here, Judy, in particular, has been thrust into the national debate over race and uh, President Donald Trump's rhetoric around immigration. I spoke to several people here who said that they do find the president partly responsible for this attack and feel that they have, in fact, been been targeted by the president for his words on immigration. Bulletproof backpack. Um, and, and Dan, what about on the Mexico side of the border in Juarez? What are people saying there? It's interesting, Judy. There's a mixed reaction on the other side of the border. Uh, I spoke to a lot of people there who said that they were not that surprised by this shooting. They said that there are so many mass shootings in America that to them, they've come to accept this as a regular part of American life. 
They said that uh, they do resent President Trump's attacks uh, on Mexicans, on Latinos generally, but that to them, the political debate playing out in the U.S. doesn't really impact their lives in a concrete way. And another thing, this Walmart actually is a popular shopping destination with many people on the other side of the border who said that for some goods like shoes and some clothes, it's actually cheaper to come here. There is a bus that goes right from the center of Juarez to this Walmart for about $1.50. A lot of people come up here and said that they're going to continue to do that just because these two cities on either sides of the Rio Grande River are so interconnected. One man told me, Judy, that he is going to be back here as soon as he can. So interesting. Dan Bush, uh, thank you for your reporting. Dan Bush uh, there in El Paso on the border. And all this leads to an urgent question being asked this week. What are lawmakers in Washington doing to deal with gun violence? Our Lisa Desjardins is here to explore where things stand. So, Lisa, I know you've been talking to a lot of people. What are they saying about whether there's any movement at all on this issue? Well, a sign that one thing is a little different came from the Republican leader of the U.S. Senate in a statement last night. Mitch McConnell said the president reached out to him, and McConnell said these words, that the president encouraged him and Republicans in the Senate to engage in bipartisan discussions of potential solutions to help protect our communities, and then added, without infringing on Americans' constitutional rights. You see there the political balance. But this is new from Senator McConnell, uh, saying that he has now directed the four committee chairs who oversee see this area of law, including guns and mental health, to find some kind of bipartisan agreement. Now, Judy, at the same time, there is a somewhat bipartisan bill that has already been passed by the House of Representatives. It is a bill that would increase background checks, ma make mandatory background checks at most gun shows, for example, that has eight Republicans supporting it. One of them is Peter King, and he is, has this message for Senator McConnell. I believe it's essential that Senator McConnell allow this to come to a vote. He doesn't have to support it. He doesn't have to get behind it. Just let it come to a vote. And I think that if anything good can come from the horrible, tra horrible tragedies of this weekend is that we can get this legislation passed. But Judy, speaking to Senator McConnell's office today, they said there's no chance that he will bring that bipartisan, somewhat bipartisan background check bill up for a vote because the president has threatened to veto it. It is not clear if he will allow any background check to come up for a vote. Talking to the other senators involved in trying to find a bipartisan agreement, it's not really clear what direction they're going to go in yet. Interesting, because the president suggested the other day that maybe some kind of background checks right. he could support. So, Lisa, I know you've been looking at all the, the legislation ideas that are out there. What exactly has been proposed so far? So I looked at every bill that has come up this new Congress. 8,000 bills on every subject have been proposed. Let's look at how many deal with guns. Of that universe, about 100, exactly 110 bills contain the word gun. Of those, Judy, only five bills have seen committee action. And some of those aren't really about the gun debate. They just might have funding for sort of a gun program that, uh, involving education or something like that. So there really is not very much action, honestly, on guns. Most of it is being driven by Democrats. It's interesting to note the most popular of those bills are the background check bill that passed the House and also a Republican bill on concealed carry that would allow someone with concealed carry permits in one state to have them in every state. That also is not moving. So you see the partisan divide. So so what are the, from, from your talking to people, and I know Congress not in town right now, but what, what does anything stand chance of passage? I will say Senator Lamar Alexander's uh, spokesperson told me today that he has taken this as a mission, as a task from Senator McConnell to find some kind of bipartisan plan that can pass. But I had to balance that, Judy, with others I spoke to, people who are key bipartisan voices here that would make a difference, who told me on the phone with that, didn't want their names used, that they just don't see the room. That another month from now until when the Senate returns, and in the voice of one person, if Newtown didn't change anything, if the universal background checks didn't pass then, they're still discouraged. I asked, well, aren't you making this sort of a fait accompli? Aren't you actually adding to the problem with that thinking? They said maybe, but we feel it so strongly. We just don't think change is coming yet. We'll see. A lot of people are going to be discouraged by that. They are discouraged now. I think that's right. Lisa Desjardins, thank you very much. You're welcome. So as has happened before in the aftermath of gruesome mass shootings, once again this week, 
two principal and competing narratives have emerged as people try to grasp how such things can happen and what might be done to prevent them. As Amna Navaz reports, some point to guns, their large numbers and easy access in this country. Others, often voices on the right, including President Trump yesterday, urge a greater focus on mental health treatment, saying that that could identify potential shooters before they act. Judy, guns kill an average of 100 people each day in this country, about 36,000 a year total. For a look at the role guns play in our lives and in the violence we live with, I'm joined by Dr. Garen Wintemute. He's an emergency medicine physician at University of California Davis Medical Center, where he's the director of the Violence Prevention Research Program. His research for decades has focused on injuries and the prevention of firearm violence. Dr. Wintermute, welcome to the News Hour. Thank you for making the time. I want to ask you about the laws because you have looked extensively at them. In the wake of these mass shootings, people want congressional action, they want legislation. What is being done on the federal or state level to improve gun safety and reduce gun violence? I think one promising strategy is the Extreme Risk Protection Order, or as we call it here, a gun violence restraining order. It has a, a number of virtues. It is effective. It is very tightly focused on people who exhibit high-risk behavior such that there is a threat in the, in the near future. Um, it's temporary. It is designed to lessen risk at a time of crisis. We are today in the wake of a series of mass shootings, and it's important to point out that ERPOs, as we call them, while they were uh, thought to be primarily useful for prevention of suicide, were generally enacted at the state level following mass shootings and have been and are being used in efforts to prevent mass shootings. And I want to be clear about these. These are the same as the so-called red flag laws people have heard so much about recently? It is the same. Uh, those of us who work in the field don't like the term red flag laws, so we use a term that actually describes what it is we're talking about. Can I ask why you don't like it? What's inaccurate about it? Sure. Um, so first off, it's, it's, as we say, very nonspecific. Red flag about what? Bugs in the basement? Um, it's also, I think this concerns me the most, it is a term that inspires fear. And we don't want to make people afraid. We want them to feel empowered. So we use terms that describe what the intervention is and convey a sense that this is something that people can do, which is precisely the point. So there's two additional bills that have had some kind of bipartisan support behind them. One is expanding background checks um, to include every gun sale or transfer. And the other is concealed carry related, that states who have and allow a concealed carry would recognize permits from other states. Would either of those contribute to reducing gun violence in America? Let me um, take expanded background checks first. There is very good evidence from our work and others that denying the purchase, denying access to firearms by people who are prohibited from having that access substantially reduces their risk of violence in the near future. We and others have identified a series of concrete flaws in the way background check policies are written and implemented that I think need to be fixed in order for them to have their maximum effectiveness. I will give you one example. There are at least nine of these. Prohibiting events very often are not reported, even when they are required to be reported. Mass shootings in Sutherland Springs, Texas, in Charlottesville, South Carolina, at Virginia Tech, all occurred because shooters who were prohibited persons were able to pass background checks and acquire their firearms because the prohibiting events were not in the data the background checks were run on. Now, reciprocity, let me just use recent events. Both Texas and Ohio, where we have had mass shootings just in the past few days, are places with concealed carry, at least one with open carry, where it, it's hard for me to imagine that among the people wisely running away from that shooting scene were a substantial number of people who were themselves armed. We, we have this collective adolescent fantasy, if I may, that an armed civilian is going to step up and prevent these events. The data show that that almost never happens. And the reason I said that it might be counterproductive is this. States vary widely in their criteria for issuing CCW permits. Some states set the bar quite high. Others set it quite low. 
high bar states, with good reason, would just as soon not have people with low bar permits inside their borders. Well, you mentioned states having different rules. Of course, that means the guns can move across different state lines as well. How much of a problem is that? And if you could, if there is one piece of legislation that you think would have an immediate effect to reduce gun violence, what would that be? I think the one thing I would put at the top of the list would be to expand background checks and make, at the same time, make them much more thorough and effective. I have to say, however, Firearm violence is a very complex problem, and the correct answer to what's the one thing is there is no one thing. We need to do a bunch of things simultaneously in order to have the effect that we want. Dr. Garen Wintermute of the University of California, Davis. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. And to help us assess the role mental health plays in gun violence and gun-related deaths, we turn to Jeffrey Swanson. He's a professor of psychiatry and behavioral science at Duke University School of Medicine. His research was part of a report released today by the National Council for Behavioral Health titled Mass Violence in America, Causes, Impacts, and Solutions. Professor Swanson, welcome back to the News Hour. I want to begin with what the president had said in the wake of this latest round of mass shootings. This is a quote. He said, mental illness and hatred pulls the trigger, not the gun. How should we understand the overlap between mental illness and people who perpetuate gun violence in America? Well, mass shootings, I mean, we're just in this national nightmare. Everybody wants it to stop, and mass shootings are so frightening and, and so irrational, and we want a, an answer to why they happened. And uh, what the president said is a very simple answer. It's mental illness. And I understand why he said that, because it resonates with what lots of people already believe about mental illness. But the facts are that the vast majority of people with mental illnesses are not violent towards other people. They never will be. And our report just released today would suggest that the prevalence of mental illness among perpetrators of mass shootings or, or mass violence is about the same as it is in the general population. So it's a very complex problem. Fixed mental health is, uh, is a slogan. It's not a solution to anything. If it is, it's a solution to a quite different public health problem, which is the problem of people with mental illnesses out in the, in the community who need uh, better mental health care. Let me ask you about something we've heard, though, from other people on the president's team as well, which is that, look, in order to be someone who carries out this kind of heinous attack, you have to be mentally ill in some way. What do you say to that? Yeah, I understand that, too, you know, to say that someone who goes out and massacres a bunch of strangers, you know, I mean, that's not the act of a healthy mind. Um, it might be a person who's alienated and troubled and angry and resentful, who's marinating in, in hate, someone who uh, is uh, indifferent and hopeless, uh, who has all kinds of problems uh, with all kinds of uh, causes. But it doesn't mean that they have one of the uh, mental illnesses defined by psychiatrists as, a, you know, a disorder of, uh, of thinking or um, mood like schizophrenia or bipolar disorder or depression. Uh, tens of millions of Americans have these illnesses, and uh, the overwhelming majority of them are not violent towards other people. They love to have a conversation about improving mental health care, and it's, it's too bad we have it on the day when there's a mass shooting. There are uh, many solutions, I think, that we could talk about to try to address uh, mass shootings. Uh, mental illness uh, is one contributing factor, uh, but it's just uh, one of many. And, you know, if we cured mental illness, our problem of violence in society would go down by about 4%. So it's not that there's no relationship at all. It's just it's, it's not quite the place you'd start. Uh, but we can certainly talk about it. Well, let me ask you. Let me ask you about one of the proposed solutions we've heard about so far, which is these so-called red flag laws. Right, the idea that you can identify someone who's potentially violent in advance and make sure they either don't have a weapon or take away the one that they have. What do you make of those of those uh, possible solutions? Well, I think they're a good idea. I think they're an important piece in the puzzle of gun violence prevention, because the the fact is that we have. Uh, a kind of a disconnect between the laws that are designed to prevent uh, certain people from uh, accessing guns at the point of sale uh, and actual risk. There are lots of people who are prohibited from guns maybe because they had an involuntary commitment uh, 25 years ago and they uh, aren't posing a risk to anyone. Meanwhile, there are lots of people who do pose a risk, uh, angry, impulsive people uh, who um, would pass a background check because they don't have any gun disqualifying record. 
So a tool like this is, is focused not on mental illness, it's focused on behavioral indicators of risk. So, you know, if, if you're a neighbor and the person next door is acting in a really threatening, menacing way and is amassing firearms, um, in many states there's nothing you can do about that if that person, you know, isn't criminally accused, hasn't uh, done anything or committed a crime. In one of the states that has an extreme risk protection order law, you can reach out to law enforcement, they can investigate it, and if there's probable cause, they can get a civil court order to remove that person's firearms temporarily uh, for their own good. It's not criminalizing. Um, and you can do the same thing if you're a family member under the most of these statutes, if let's say a relative of yours um, is in a suicidal crisis and has guns. You know, your, your loved one is, uh, let's say, uh, depressed and, and bereaved or drinking heavily and has guns and, you know, this might save their life because uh, lots of people attempt suicide. If they use anything else, they're very likely to survive. If they use a firearm, it's so lethal uh, that they're, they, they almost never survive. We just want to stop so many people from dying. We could focus on limiting access to lethal means and I think this law actually is one of the few things that can find some common ground and bridge the gap between people who want to do gun control and people who think that uh, it's people and not guns who kill people. Common ground is something we're all looking for these days. Professor Jeffrey Swanson, Duke University School of Medicine, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Stay with us coming up on the news hour. What, if anything, could break the political gridlock stalling gun legislation? Sitting down with Democratic presidential candidate Governor Steve Bullock of Montana. Plus, remembering the life and legacy of Nobel Prize winning author Toni Morrison. But first, China's central government strongly condemned today what it calls extreme violence from protesters in Hong Kong. The condemnation came after a day of clashes and a general strike that disrupted public transportation and blocked major roads. Jonathan Miller of Independent Television News has the story. The most violent, most sustained popular challenge to the Communist Party of China in decades was today met with Beijing's strongest denunciations in nine weeks of turmoil. Don't play with fire, the spokesman for China's state council warned. He branded the ringleaders deranged as he threatened a blow from the sword of the law lay in store for them. Their insurrection was doomed, he said. I must warn all criminals not to misjudge the situation and mistake our restraint for weakness. They must not underestimate the firm determination and tremendous strength of the central government and the people of the whole country to safeguard Hong Kong's prosperity and stability and to safeguard the fundamental interests of the country. Yang Guang offered no solutions and did not address grievances. Instead, he reminded Hong Kongers who was boss. The People's Liberation Army is an incomparably strong and powerful force for safeguarding the security of every inch of the sacred territory of the motherland. Last week, the PLA's Hong Kong garrison released this video showing its troops training to confront protesters. Asked today if he could rule out intervention, Yang Guang said China would never allow any turbulence that would threaten national unity. Hong Kong law provides for the PLA to deploy if the territory's semi-autonomous government hits the panic button. Yesterday's disturbances alone resulted in 148 arrests, police firing 800 tear gas canisters and 140 rubber bullets. Rubber bullets were not used by the PLA at Tiananmen Square 30 years ago when the army killed thousands of pro-democracy demonstrators. Today, three masked Hong Kong protesters held a press briefing to decry what they called the lack of self-discipline by the police. They apologized for the inconvenience yesterday's day-long strike had caused. The pursuit of democracy, liberty and equality and equality is the inalienable rights of every citizen. We therefore, we therefore call on the government to refrain 
from exterminating our right to pursue these universal values. As Hong Kong cleaned up after yet another long weekend of chaos, many returning to work spoke of their enduring support for protesters. Chaos is caused by the government, not the protester. I think they have tried every peaceful mean. We have the largest uh, march uh, since Hong Kong returned the sovereignty to uh, China. Uh, we have two million people marching on the street and the government still doesn't listen. It's true. Less than two months ago, a third of Hong Kong's population marched peacefully in protest against a reviled extradition bill. And now, it's transformed into a fully-fledged civil resistance movement, defiantly rejecting the lengthening reach of Beijing, who is deaf to Hong Kong's demands, unsympathetic, and whose patience is now worn thin. And now we turn back to guns in America and we look at the politics. Joining me is former U.S. Representative Carlos Corbello. He is a Republican who represented Florida for four years until 2018. Congressman Corbello, thank you very much for joining us. I want to ask you first why you are speaking out on this issue. You did serve in Congress. You were defeated last November by uh, someone else who had a, a stronger record uh, on, on gun control, if you will, uh, uh, a woman whose, whose father had been uh, killed in a gun accident, in a gun incident. Um, so what has, what has compelled you to continue to speak out about it? Judy, good evening. For me, this issue stopped being a partisan issue a long time ago. While I was in Congress, we had the Pulse shooting in Orlando, Florida. And after that, uh, I joined with Seth Moulton, a Democrat from Massachusetts, to introduce a version of the no-fly, no-buy legislation, which could have prevented that tragedy had it been in place before then. Then, of course, we had uh, the horrible uh, massacre in Las Vegas. Uh, and again, uh, uh, came together with uh, Democrats to try to get a bipartisan solution. Uh, universal background checks, 72-hour waiting periods, uh, uh, raising the uh, minimum age to 21 for all gun purchases, red flag laws. These are common sense solutions that uh, will save lives in our country. And mental health is a major challenge, but mental health cannot be used as an excuse to refuse to act on gun reform. And in fact, we've just been heard, Amna Nawaz, my colleague, interviewing uh, a psychiatrist at Duke University who says all the research shows that most gun violence is not committed uh, by people who are, who are mentally ill. But I want to drill down on what kind of legislation, what changes can be made practically uh, in, this, in this current political envi environment. What can happen, do you think? Well, in the wake of this horrible tragedy, we have seen some Republicans come out strongly in favor of red flag laws. Senator Lindsey Graham, uh, who chairs the Senate Judiciary Committee, is prepared to move that legislation. Uh, we've also seen some House Republicans join uh, the legislation that would require universal background checks. It would close all of the loopholes when it comes to universal background checks. But right so now... this is a good sign. The, the question, Judy, is whether Republican leadership, specifically in the Senate, will allow this legislation to move forward. When I was in the House, we worked hard. We tried to convince leadership uh, to allow this legislation to come to the floor, and they didn't. But again, my colleague Lisa Desjardins reported just a few minutes ago that right now, the Senate Majority Leader, Mitch McConnell, is saying he's not going to put that background check legislation on the floor, ostensibly because he says President uh, Trump would veto it, wouldn't support it. Um, so what is it that's holding, holding back the president? What's holding back other Republicans? Well, the president, in his remarks, did say that he was in favor of stronger background checks. So the White House will have to explain why he would veto universal background check legislation. I can tell you this, Judy. Last November, a lot of Republicans lost 
because of this issue, especially in suburban America, voters are losing their patience. They want to see action on gun reform. They understand it's a constitutional right. They don't want to confiscate anyone's guns. They just want laws that keep guns out of the hands of dangerous people. That's reasonable. It's common sense. And if uh, uh, Senator McConnell wants to keep his majority, uh, he should really consider allowing some of this legislation to move forward. If that's the case, though, uh, Congressman Corbello, why are, do we not hear from more Republican members who say they're changing their minds, they're, they're prepared to vote on this? Well, we have seen some statement, statements recently, Judy, but the reason why a, a lot of members of Congress don't act or don't compromise or don't move towards the center is because they fear a primary challenge. And without question, this is a potent issue in Republican primaries. The NRA is a very powerful organization. But what I can tell a lot of uh, my former Republican colleagues, uh, who uh, many of who are my friends, is that there are other organizations out there, like Everytown USA, for example, that are willing to come out in support of Republicans that take a reasonable approach to gun reform, that support some of these obvious measures that do not diminish Second Amendment rights, but do keep innocent people safer. Is there something about the way the arguments are being made that you think could be shifted, could be changed, that would bring more current opponents on board? I think, unfortunately, it's going to take political pressure. And uh, we've already seen some Republicans reacting, colleagues who, uh, when I was in Congress, uh, wouldn't even consider universal background check legislation or red flag uh, legislation. Uh, some of these members of Congress have made uh, strong statements in the wake of this tragedy. And hopefully, those statements will uh, turn into votes and we can heal on this issue. We can uh, start taking steps to solve this issue. And by the way, Judy, it's not just for the sake of gun reform. The American people want to see their Congress work and compromise and uh, find common ground. If we get a compromise on gun reform, that will help start to restore a lot of the trust and confidence that Americans have lost in Congress and in government more broadly. Former Congressman Carlos Curbelo uh, of Florida, thank you very much for joining us. We appreciate thank it. Thank you, Judy. We now continue our series of conversations with Democratic presidential candidates. Steve Bullock is the two-term governor of Montana, and he joins me now. Governor Bullock, thank you for being here. Judy, it's great to be with you. So you are the governor of a state of a little over a million people, very red, very conservative. Donald Trump won it by over 20 points. Why should Democrats support you? Well, I think that, yeah, I'm the only one in this race that actually won in a state where Trump won. He took Montana by 20 points. I won by four. 25 to 30 percent of my voters voted for Donald Trump. If we can't win back some of these places we lost, we're not going to win. And it's also more than that. I mean, even with what is a right now 60 percent Republican legislature, we've been able to demonstrate that you can get meaningful things done that impact people's everyday lives. And people want both the economy and D.C. to work for them. Being outside of Washington, D.C., I think I have a little bit of different perspective than most folks here. You called yourself progressive, and you have favored things like the earned income tax credit. You were able to expand Medicaid in the state of Montana. But there are other Democrats, like Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren, who would say the country needs big and bold after Donald Trump. It needs things like the Green New Deal, like Medicare for all. Yeah, and I call myself progressive and believe it because at the core of that word really is progress. We need to be able to make a meaningful difference for people's lives. We can't just talk about the challenges. We have to actually be, first be able to hear Americans and address those challenges. So I want to make sure that as I'm proposing things, it's not like with Medicare for all. I don't discount it because it's like it couldn't get it done necessarily. I do discount it in as much as I don't think that's the best policy solution. And the most progressive solution is to make sure everybody has health care that's affordable. And you can do that without upending what's been about 
It took about 70 years to get to where we were when the Affordable Care Act passed. So let's build on that. Let's not just rip it apart. Guns, uh, uppermost in our minds right now, as you know. Your own family's been touched by gun violence. You've talked about your uh, then 11-year-old nephew yeah. being uh, shot to death on a school playground, uh, what, 25 years ago. When you campaigned for re-election in 2016, uh, you were against universal background sure. checks. Now you are for them. Why the change? Things like universal background checks. It's not just Democrats that say they would like this. I mean. NRA members say this makes sense. And as a gun owner, I mean, I'm calling on other gun owners to say, we all want to keep our community safe. We can do it in ways that, with, as an example, universal background checks. But you acknowledge your position changed because, of, because of what you've seen. Some people are saying President Trump's language, his rhetoric, has contributed to part of what's going on. How do you see it? Yeah, I certainly, in he is, you know, I would never want to put the blood of people all across this country on one person's hands. Um, but for him to say we have to speak with one voice when it comes to speaking out against race, racism and white nationalism and bigotry, when so much of the language that he's used over this last two and a half years has included racism, equivocating on white nationalism and bigotry. So you can't say this just the day after shootings when you haven't lived it for the last two and a half years. I do think that, you know, when tacitly even white nationalists might think, well, this guy, if he equivocates on Char Charlottesville, he has my back. I don't think that helps at all with what we are as a country. Campaign finance. You have been um, waging a legal battle against so-called dark money. Uh, this is money from donors who aren't identified. You recently won a lawsuit against the Trump administration having to do with foreign money, transparency. My question is, without a constitutional amendment to overturn the Supreme Court Citizens United decision, which, as you know, lifted restrictions sure. on corporate uh, political spending, is there a way to keep dark money out of American politics? Oh, I think there absolutely is. Even in Montana, with the two-thirds Republican legislature, we passed a law that said, if you're going to spend in our elections, I don't care if you're a 501c4, I don't care what you call yourself, in the last 90 days, you have to disclose all that spending and the contributions. So two other things. You would then support an amendment to, to overturn. I would love to see the 28th Amendment the citizens, passed. Citizens United. Absolutely. So you're fighting dark money, but we know that you are also tonight in Washington scheduled to yeah. attend a closed-door fundraiser uh, with a registered lobbyist as one of the co-hosts, a man named Jay Driscoll. This has been reported by the Center for Public Integrity. He's lobbied 35 or so clients just this year, many of whom give corporate money, yeah. but don't disclose. Yeah, but they certainly don't give corporate money to me. I mean, the fact that we can even be having this conversation is what I want to add is the sunshine and transparency. In as much as many of the presidential candidates now have super PACs, some may even take corporate PAC money. I've said no PACs, no super PACs, all individuals and disclosed completely under, you know, the allowable rules so that we can have this conversation so that one individual helping out a fundraiser certainly isn't going to be influencing my everyday actions. And I think that it's, to me, the more nefarious is the lack of transparency and sunshine. The environment. You don't support the Green New Deal, uh, which critics say is too radical. But if climate is an existential threat, why not do something dramatic? Oh, no, and we do have to take bold and immediate steps. I mean, I'm from the West. Our fire seasons are 48 days longer than what they were about four decades ago. So rejoining Paris, the auto industry didn't even want the removal of these fuel efficiency standards. Investing in technology and research so we can get more renewables onto the grid. We know, you know, the scientists say we have to be carbon neutral, not as a country, but as a world by 2050. I think we could do it by 2040 or even earlier. All right, we will leave it there. Governor Steve Bullock, thank you very much. Thanks for having me, Judy. And our series of conversations with the Democratic presidential candidates continues tomorrow with billionaire philanthropist Tom Steyer.
Finally tonight, an appreciation of author and Nobel laureate Toni Morrison, who died last night. Jeffrey Brown looks back at how she helped to transform modern American letters. This tribute is part of Canvas, our ongoing arts and culture coverage. As editor, teacher, and most of all, writer, Toni Morrison changed and enhanced American literature. In 2012, on the campus of Howard University, where she'd been an undergraduate, she looked back to her younger self, just starting out in the world. I was so confident and uh, capable. The future was, you know, right there, right at your fingertips. And I was so happy to be among what I hadn't had when I was in Ohio, uh, African-American intellectuals. And that was the company I wanted to keep. She worked as a book editor first and was nearly 40 when her first novel, The Bluest Eye, was published, followed by Sula, The Song of Solomon, and other books, 11 novels, children's books, and essay collections that made her reputation for bringing to the fore a distinctly African-American story, rooted in history and the legacy of slavery, written in a powerful voice like no other. Setha was trying to make up for the handsaw. Beloved was making her pay for it. Beloved, widely considered her masterwork, was published in 1987 and won the Pulitzer Prize. Could stay the night if you had a mind to. A 1998 film version starred Oprah Winfrey. As a mother who escaped her Kentucky master and upon capture in Ohio, killed her own daughter rather than have her forced back into a life of slavery. Morrison spoke to the NewsHour's Charlene Hunter Galt when the novel first came out. I read an article in a 19th century newspaper about a woman whose name was Margaret Garner. It was uh, an article that stayed with me for a long, long time and seemed to have in it an extraordinary uh, idea that was worthy of a novel, which was this compulsion to nurture, this ferocity that a woman has to be responsible for her children and at the same time, the kind of tensions that exist in trying to be a separate, complete individual. In a recent documentary film, Toni Morrison, The Pieces I Am, Morrison spoke of her goals as a writer. I didn't want to speak for black people. I wanted to speak to and to be among, it's us. So the first thing I had to do was to eliminate the white gaze. Jimmy Baldwin used to talk about that. The little white man that sits on your shoulder <laughs> and checks out everything you do and say. So to knock him off. And, you know, you're free. Now I own the world. I mean, I can write about anything to anyone, for anyone. Morrison was awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1993, the first African-American woman to win, praised by the Academy for her, quote, visionary force. And she was given the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the nation's highest civilian honor, by Barack Obama in 2012. Morrison was on the bestseller list again in 1997 for her novel Paradise, set in an Oklahoma town called Ruby. And the NewsHour's Elizabeth Farnsworth talked to her of the period when freedmen left plantations, sometimes under duress. The isolation, the separateness is always a part of any utopia. And it was my meditation, if you will, an interrogation of the whole idea of paradise, the safe place, the place full of bounty, where you're, uh, no one can harm you. But in addition to that, it's based on the notion of exclusivity. All paradises, all utopias are defined by who is not there, by the people who are not allowed in. In 2005, Morrison wrote the libretto for Margaret Garner, an opera based on the story from which she wove Beloved. Composed by Richard Daniel Poor, it starred Denise Graves. At the time, Morrison told me how moved she was by the experience. There's this other thing which is a kind of restoration, uh, redemption, that the opera can offer via its music, its words, its singers, and its stage to the audience. So that when you leave, you know more, you felt more, and you felt more deeply. But somehow, 
you are more human than you were, or you feel more human, more humane, more capable than you did when you came in. More human, more humane, more capable. Words that express what Toni Morrison herself created in a literature that so deeply affected her readers. Morrison died Monday in New York. She was 88 years old. And joining us now is one of many writers who were influenced by Toni Morrison. Tracy K. Smith is the former poet laureate of the United States. Her latest volume is Wade in the Water. She's a professor and head of the Lewis Center for the Arts at Princeton University, where Toni Morrison taught for many years. Tracy, it's nice to talk to you again. First, talk about Toni Morrison, the writer. What stood out for you in the language, the story she told? Well, I feel like what stands out for me is the amazing vigor and resourcefulness, the beautiful aesthetic sense that drives her work, the way that we can be moving forward and deeper into a world that is made up of characters, voices, and then suddenly we're in what almost feels like a spirit level. Um, her work activates a, a beautiful human urgency that stems from the social conditions that her characters, um, her characters live in and are touched by. Uh, but it never stops being poetry. It never stops being a living language. And I think that's something that's been hugely inspiring to so many writers, myself included. And what's, what story did she tell over her life as a writer? I feel like um, Morrison provides us as Americans with a vocabulary for acknowledging and grappling with the effects, the ongoing effects of slavery upon all of us, no matter who we are. Um, she reminds us that the lives of blacks who are often at the center of that story exist on a mythic scale, that we're central to what America is, what it believes itself to be, and what, it's, what it might actively be um, pushing against as well. Um, it's a story that lives in history, but I think it takes art to bring those questions and those realities um, into an urgent kind of contact with who we are as people. Mm -hmm. Morrison used to talk about, you know, crossing the, the mere air that sits between yourself and another person and how difficult that is sometimes. But it's the language of, of literature and um, an art that helps us to do that. It pulls us out of ourselves and makes us beholden to to other people who might be um, strangers to us. You were talking about the influence she had on you and so many writers personally. Tell me a little bit about that. You knew her as a, you were a young writer. She's there on campus. What is that like? Who was she to you? Oh gosh, I remember, I remember in my first year on this campus, I was given a classroom that sat in what was essentially a vestibule outside of Toni Morrison's office. And on maybe the third or fourth week of class, she walked through that space on her way into her office, and my heart stopped. I knew she taught here, but I had never seen her. And I felt this huge welling of awe and gratitude um, just arrest me. And I thought, oh, this is, I'm in the presence not only of greatness, but I'm in the presence of the real. I'm in the presence of, you know, the living word, logos in a way. Um, of course, she was so generous and present and devoted to her students and had a really beautiful way of breaking down that, that sense of awe and, and making herself useful to the young people that she was teaching. Um, but she never stopped being great. That's for sure. Tracy K. Smith on the life and work of Toni Morrison. Thank you very much. She never stopped being great. And that is the News Hour for tonight. I'm Judy Woodruff. Join us online and again here tomorrow evening. For all of us at the PBS News Hour, thank you, and we'll see you soon.
You're watching PBS.